up, everybody? Welcome to the Canes Inside Daily Podcast, powered by Anajar and Levine Accident Attorneys. Happy Friday. It's been a great week. We are not in the studio. Um, had some internet difficulties, so recording at home. But wanted to give you the bank. The people have been asking. I know you've been, where's the bank? You guys have been doing the Canes Connection Zoom calls with all that insider information. Are you going to drop an old-fashioned bank? Yes, we are today. So you will get the absolute latest on Miami's uh, recruiting. High school recruiting portal, everything else, I will give that to you shortly. We also have a special guest, Frank Gabriel, a former long snapper, former snapper for the Miami Hurricanes. He's going to talk about the walk-on experience and the specialist experience, kind of take you behind the scenes of the guys that you see on the screen, but you don't really know what's going on there. Um, Really excited to talk to him. He was a great guest, gave us a lot of insight. So shout out to Frank Gabriel uh, on the back end of this. Uh, First, want to talk about some folks that, also kind of operate without needing to be seen all the time. That's Anajar and Lane Accident Attorneys. They're going to be working for your case, making sure that you are taken care of. Dial 1-800-747-FREE, 1-800-747-3733. If you or someone you care about has been in an accident, take back control of your life. All right. It is time for the bank. They've been asking. They've been saying, what are you going to do the bank? You're doing all this stuff for the Canes Connection members, which, by the way, I'll continue to do. Uh, for all those folks who are contributing, but still going to take care of everybody else with the bank on the latest in recruiting. And I'm just going to go right through it, man. Um, Starting with the portal. Really, we're towards the end of it here with the portal. The main name on the board is Tyler Barron, uh, the defensive end from Kentucky. And basically what I can tell you is we have a great chance there. It is a battle. You know, this portal stuff is, especially with big time guys like that, is very much like free agency. So you don't really know until the battle's done. So, you know, nothing is guaranteed. Things can always change in the last second, similar NFL free agency. But I'll say Miami is in a very good position with Tyler Barron. That would be my prediction if I was predicting today, Friday, 3.51 p.m. If we land Tyler Barron, I think that's a wrap. The only other potential addition in the portal would be a nickel corner. And it would be someone that's committed to another school, most likely, that hasn't enrolled yet. I would say that's less likely to happen than Barron. But it is a potential outcome. Miami will continue to 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 evaluate uh, corners that are in the portal as a nickel addition, but I'm not sure that's a guarantee. I think they if they get Barron, that's likely the end. But they could add a nickel corner who's already in the portal against someone who's committed to another school, most likely. The scholarships are getting tight, and that's because Miami's done a very good job of adding talent, retaining the players they need to retain. Uh, the portal came and went and you didn't have the, the heartbreaking departures, which is what you want to see, which is good. Um, one name who is making the scholarship situation tighter, but it's good news is Elias Rudolph, the defensive end from Cincinnati. He's someone the Miami signed four-star player flipped him from Michigan. And then he kind of went dark. He had an injury, um, which caused him to miss his senior season, but he was struggling to qualify as well. Miami did not know if they'd add him to the class. Miami did add him to the class, and and, uh, please pull up uh, that picture of him in track just so that people can see you're seeing him in his track, uh, his track team, the four-by-one. He looks like a giant. He's gained a ton of weight since his injury. Uh, He looks very much like a future NFL defensive end physically with the added muscle. He's still every bit of 6'5", 6'6", extremely explosive, extremely twitchy, high motor, can hit him with a spin move, has different kinds of moves, was very productive as a junior as we pull up his huddle tape and you can see what he can do. This is somebody who is basically, you know, he was in the class, but the reason he wasn't talked about is because there was a lot of concern about whether he would qualify and his injury. Both of those are clear. There was also a concern about whether he was going to gain enough weight. Now you see the weight coming off. So when you look at Elias Rudolph now, again, probably one of the least talked about members of this class, especially for a blue chipper, you say, all right, we know he's healthy. We know the weight's coming on. We know he's qualified. So what are we getting as a prospect? Six foot five, six foot six. Again, running the four by one. So you know how fast he is. We love players who run track, who play other sports like basketball, especially the pass rush position. You need that athleticism. He's bringing that to you. And the weight's coming on. As you see from the picture, he looks like a giant. And you watch the film, high motor. Cincinnati is a very, very good football area. Uh, some great athletes there, some very tough football players. Was committed to Michigan. You know what, uh, John, you know Jim Harbaugh, when it comes to evaluating edge rushers, whether it's Uche, Aiden Hutchinson, he always has some very, very, very talented edge rushers that go to the NFL draft. And this year is no exception. 
And the fact that he wanted a guy like Rudolph speaks highly of Rudolph. I was able to flip him, beat out Ohio State, beat out some other schools in that area, and land this tremendous prospect. So adding him when he could have not qualified, and maybe he looked like he was not going to qualify for a second, um, that makes the scholarship situation tighter. But it's a good situation because you're adding a high-quality player with NFL upside at a premium position. So shout out to Elias Rudolph for doing what he needed to do to qualify. And Miami is extremely excited to add this athlete, this pass rusher to Marquise Lightfoot, uh, to Booker Pickett, and to the guys already in the room, Cole McConathy. That edge room, even though they lost some folks to the portal, is looking very, very strong. Add a Tyler Barron, add an Elias Rudolph, add a Booker Pickett who hasn't enrolled yet. That's going to be a very, very exciting room in camp. Moving on to a name that you guys might not have heard about, pull up his huddle right now, which is Tim Merritt, a uh, defensive back out of Birmingham, Alabama. He's a teammate of Naeem Offord, who is going to Ohio State. Another guy with some Miami interest to keep an eye on. Tim Merritt's a name that's on our board that Miami is really, really high on, and I think people need to start paying attention to. He has a long safety at the high school level, although he projects as a corner, 6'2", 190, Runs track. You can see how fast he is in these clips. You can see how big he is in these clips. Somebody who plays some receiver as well, again, can run, runs track. You're seeing more of that this class with Miami, getting guys that are true athletes at the defensive back position, also targeting Andrew Purcell, who's from Enterprise, Alabama, another Alabama kid. You want to add guys that can run, that can play multiple sports, that can play offense, that can play defense, and then also play defensive back. If you get somebody who only plays defensive back, they're typically not as athletic as some of these other guys. So Miami's trying to increase the athleticism in that room. DJ Pickett, a track star who also plays both ways. He's a major target. Ben Hanks, baseball player, tests out of the gym as far as running and, and returns kicks for or returns picks for touchdowns. Bryce Fitzgerald, offense, defense, plays basketball. This is a profile what Miami wants at defensive back in this class. And Tim Merritt fits right in. Again, play safety like a lot of guys play safety in high school because they're the best def defensive player on the team. They can help the high school team more safety, but he'll move to corner in the pros. Miami really, really likes this player. Put him on your radar. Again, Miami is trying to increase that, that defensive back room, the athleticism. And look, Alabama's been good to Miami. Bobby Pruitt, who's been a standout freshman since he got here in spring. Cole McConaughey, who started the spring game, defensive end. Both of those guys from Mobile, Alabama. Another guy from the area, uh, Michael Jackson. If you remember him from the 2017-2018 teams, he's negotiating a new contract with Seattle Seahawks right now, playing multiple years in the pros. So Alabama is a place where you can get really, really good players that are not necessarily going to the University of Alabama. And I think Miami is continuing to work there. We talked about the enterprise kids last week. Miami has a lot of steam with Eric Winters, Andrew Purcell, Zion Grady, add Tim Merritt from Birmingham to the list. And Naeem Alford, who's committed to Ohio State, don't rule him out either. That's the name that's picking, out steam, picking up steam. All right. Uh, on the offensive line, it was reported that Lamar Williams out of Havana, Florida, who was a longtime commit, uh, decommitted, sort of a mutual parting. I, I think, you know, he has a lot of tools, but I think Miami is, 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 has no shortage of options at the offensive line room um, in terms of guys they are after. You talk about in Las Vegas, Susu Alofatuli. I had a pull of his name, so I didn't pronounce it too terribly, from Las Vegas, visited in spring. He was someone that was crystal ball to Miami. The communication died down a little bit. Then the communication picked right back up, visited in spring. Miami went and saw him uh, at his practice said he was absolutely unreal. One of the best players they saw all spring. This is the spring evaluation period, by the way. You might hear me make reference to that multiple times. Miami is going out and seeing players who are on their list, seeing practice spring football. Some of these guys they've never seen in person. Some of these guys they haven't seen in a while, so they want to see where these guys are at. So you're going to see guys drop in the evaluation. You're going to see guys rise in the evaluation as Miami continues to make its rounds. Um, Susu. I'm pronouncing that right, hopefully, was a guy that definitely arrow pointing up. Another name Miami really likes. This is a, another tough name for me, so I'm trying my best, guys. Uh, from Neptune Beach, Fletcher High School, offensive lineman named Tekalen Mukes, M-U-E-X. Miami loves him, loves his aggression, loves his upside. He'll be taking an official visit. Uh, Miami just offered him. He's like a no-star right now, but you'll see him climb. He has multiple power four offers. Dimitri Manning, the massive offensive lineman from uh, Washington State. Taron Hedrick from Naples. I talked about him earlier. 
lost a little bit of steam for a while, but now that Miami's put eyes on him, arrow pointing up. Really liked how he looked in spring, and I think he's going to be named is going to heat right back up. Spike Sowell is another guy Miami liked a lot when they saw him from the Kentucky area interior lineman. Isaac Spike Sowell's um, Miami has a very high grade on, and it's going up after seeing him. Another name I want you guys to keep an eye on, shifting to the receiver position. Going back to Alabama, this is a theme you're seeing. Phoenix City, Alabama wide receiver, Dalen Upshaw. He is visiting June 7th on an official. Florida's in the mix. Uh, UCF is in the mix. But Dalen Upshaw from Phoenix City, Alabama is someone that Miami really, really likes. Um, in terms of measurables, 5'11", 175, but very dynamic. He is somebody who's really uh, impressed in the offseason circuit. Um, he played in the OT, uh, the OT7 Orlando, and was one of the top performers there. Um, he was, again, somebody who was just a playmaker and has the interest of the Florida schools, including Florida, including Miami. Really the only non-Florida wide receiver that I've heard a lot about on Miami's board. Miami's so focused on these Florida guys, Jamie French, Dallas Wilson, Cortez Mills, uh, Jordan, Joshua Moore, I'm sorry. So uh, he's one that's creeping in from the outside. Other guys that Miami's really getting some traction with in this class. Linebacker Jaden Perlot from Georgia, committed to Georgia, really, really talented kid. I mentioned the Enterprise Trio from Alabama, Zion Grady, defensive end, Eric Winters, linebacker, Andrew Purcell, corner, safety. I mean, loves all three of those kids. Would take each one of them independently, but would love to land them as a trio. A uh, Hayden Lowe from California, big pass rusher. Saw him in person when he visited in the spring. Really, really big-bodied, talented kid. Miami loves him. Jabari Antoine, LSU commit, defensive back. Miami's working. Aiden Anding, a, a rising corner who was a basketball player for much of his athletic career, has just shifted to corner in, in high school and is balling out. Arrow up guy. Um, and Derry Norris, a defensive tackle from Florida, who is um, somebody that Miami's had on the radar for a while. He's from Spruce Creek. Talked to him. Talked about him. 6'3", 265. I mean, like them, they like him even more after seeing him. He's his arrows pointing up, very productive player at the high school level. Uh, running back, you know, Miami's not sweating the running back position. They are closely evaluating guys like um, Shakai Mills Knight and Jasper Parker, big body guys. They want to see those guys in person. Shakai Mills Knight's definitely someone who's rising up the board and had a very good visit. Jasper Parker, another guy who had a good visit. I wants to see those guys in action running the ball. They're in no hurry. Also on Brian Lewis, the running back from, from American Heritage. They saw Jared Pringle, their running back commit from Armwood live in spring. Loved what he did. He's another guy that that evaluation, that grade's going up. He brings the speed. They like to add some size. Shakai Mills Knight and Jasper Parker, Byron Lewis, the names I'd watch there. They'll be getting some eyes on linebacker Ty Jackson out of Loxahatchee. Very, very athletic player. Uh, Miami's going to keep an eye on him and try to see where he's at. Someone else who – some other guys who impressed in, in spring eval period. These are commits. Luke Nickel went out and saw him, liked what we saw. Looks like everything they thought he was going to be quarterback of this class unquestioned. Um, Brock Shot right now is injured, the, the tight end that I love out of Indiana. Nothing bad, but he just hasn't – He's been limited in spring, but Luca Gilbert, the commit out of Ohio, the other tight end commit. I heard he had an unbelievable workout uh, for Miami that they, you know, he filmed and showed to. They were able to see when he when he was there working out. They were able to watch him, and they were very impressed. Almost six eight, you know, two fifty. Um, just somebody who really brings a dynamic movement ability at that size. You see six seven, almost six eight, two fifty. You're thinking tackle, but I'm told they're looking at him as a tight end. He was running routes, looking really good at his practice. Um, other guys, Herbert Scroggins, really, really talented pass rusher out of Georgia. Miami loves him. Um, and then one name I want to mention, please pull up the huddle uh, on Javion Campbell, 6'5", 265 from Kentucky. This is a guy who is rated as a 255 on the composite. So basically a mid four star. This guy this is me talking. He is a five star all day. You can show me your top 50, 247's top 50. I'm thinking this guy over 90% of that list. This guy is an elite, elite, elite talent as you watch the film. 6'5", 265. He's the all-time leading basketball scorer for his schools. So the all-time leading scorer on the basketball team for his school. Just started playing football last year as a junior at 14 and a half sacks. You see the power. You see the size. You see the athletic ability. He's tenacious. He's a football player when he plays football. He's not just a basketball player. 
but he brings that athleticism and height. Plus, he's he's heavy. So this dude, he was going to visit Ohio State May 31st. Canceled that. He's going to visit Miami on, on May 31st, first weekend. Also visiting Alabama. Also visiting Georgia. Also visiting Auburn. Visiting Kentucky as well, hometown school. So you can see from the offers and the schools after him what where this guy's in the pecking order. In my personal list, I put him right at the top. You can keep your five stars. This guy's a five-star all day and a major, major priority for the Miami Hurricanes. And if you're watching this film, you can see why Miami is so big on this athlete with his size, tenacity, and power. A lot of times basketball kids don't play with power, but this guy can knock you back. And you see him right there knocking the, the tackle into the running back. He has knockback ability, and he doesn't even know what he's doing. But the stuff you can't teach, the size, athleticism, tenacity, aggression, he has that in spades. I'm putting this guy again at the top of the list. This is the kind of guy you gotta you gotta really uh, deliver in high school because it's very hard to get these kind of guys in the portal. Get them in high school like Alabama and Georgia does. Stack them like we did with Justin Scott, Armando Blunt last year, Artavius Jones. Stack guys like this on top of that. You're cooking with gas. Um, I talked to my sources about spring because now you know obviously they saw spring practice. I saw spring practice, uh, but now these guys are you know they're done. You've been able to evaluate them. The hectic portal period's kind of quieted down. You can sit back and say, who looked good when you went back and watched the film? Some guys I, I was told were the most improved players in spring. Malik Bryant did an outstanding job as Jack linebacker. He's going to play a role. Very dynamic. Felt comfortable in his position. Great instincts. Great football player. Isaiah Horton, the wide receiver we talked about on this podcast, looks like a whole new man. Bigger, faster, new number. You saw him in the spring game make two big plays. And then Wesley Bassaint, starting linebacker. Jalen Alderman is not coming to take his job, although he's another starting caliber player. But Wesley Bassaint, I'm told, looked unbelievable in spring, much improved, poised for a breakout, doing all the right things on the field, off the field, just really, really hitting his stride year three. He was one of Cristobal's first signees. So talk about developing players into NFL players. That's what you want to see. Wesley Basanth is one to keep an eye on there. In terms of uh, creatures, you know, internally, Miami likes to call these freak of athlete or freak of nature athletes creatures, guys that look like Georgia players, not, you know, Alabama players, the national championship standard. Names that were identified as creatures Bobby Pruitt, the linebacker slash safety from Mobile, Alabama, Elijah Lofton, the tight end, fullback, running back, wide receiver, you name it, from Las Vegas. Talked a lot about both those guys on the podcast. One thing we haven't talked a lot about, Damari Brown, the second-year player at American Heritage, the corner. I'm told that if he plays like he played the last week in the season, you're talking about an impact star player at cornerback. That's how strongly they feel about his ability. And then another name, Marquise Lightfoot, another guy who finished strong, plays really hard, great power for his, for his size. He hasn't gotten that much weight on him, but he's playing very powerful, and he's extremely fast and explosive. You saw a taste of that in the spring game. So that's the bank. That's what we got. We are going to pivot now. Napper for the Kings from 2012 uh, through 2016. He's got some great stories, great insight on being a specialist, being a walk-on. You guys are going to love this interview. Uh, shout out to Caneswear. They got all the Florida Panther gear. If you're into Florida Panthers and following this playoff run, go to Caneswear.com. They have a ton of selection for the Florida Panthers. and They got sales going on every single day. Um, check out Caneswear. All right, very cool segment here. We are going to be talking about the part of the game that is integral to championship teams. It doesn't get a lot of publicity, a lot of mystery surrounding it. So we're going to find out what actually goes into not only being a walk-on player at a big program like Miami, but also being a specialist player at a big program like Miami. And we have the privilege of hosting 2012 to 2016 snapper for the Miami Hurricanes, Frank Gabriel. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Oh, man, a pleasure, man, pleasure. You know, we got to talk in a practice, and we'll talk about what you saw at practice uh, this spring. But really, to me, I really wanted to bring you in because I follow, obviously, closely. We do this show every day. I know so little about what happens for the walk-ons when they come in to when they make the team and to what specialists do every day. Aside from just seeing it out of the corner of my eye, we had to bring you in and kind of shed some light on this process because every team needs it and we don't really know what goes on man so again appreciate you joining us absolutely yeah i'm happy to tell my story <laughs> so listen so you're from mama mama's new jersey right yeah uh mama's county uh my my i'm from a very small like beach town called mama beach mm -hmm. um 
near Long Branch, New Jersey. Yeah, which is cool in Red Bank, New Jersey. Is that like the Jersey Shore, like you see on TV? The northmost uh, section of the Jersey Shore. Gotcha. So uh, Sta- Sandy Hook State Park is like right there north. That kind of starts the beaches off. And then, yeah. Were you like focused on your tan in, in, in high school and your, your laundry and the gym as a whole? <laughs> Definitely have my tan going. I get pretty dark in the summer, to be honest. Um, didn't gel my hair too much when I was younger. Uh, more so in college. Yeah, yeah I mean, it was, I felt like I was watching Miami when I watched that show. Very similar to how I grew up down here. But anyway, it's okay. So you're in Monmouth County. Uh, I'm assuming, so you played football in high school, of course. Yes. Actually, uh, I was the uh, offensive tackle, believe it or not. I was the first team all division. Um, yeah. And how was your size in high school? So I was definitely bigger, um, about 230, 235. My legs were stronger. I, um, upper body was never that strong, but um, also definitely chubby on the chubbier side. <laughs> yeah, not quite the weight program of college yet. Yeah. So were you snapping in high school? Yeah, I actually started. So I started uh, football in sixth grade. And I started because, you know, I didn't have that many friends. I was overweight. My mom was like, let's try something new. And, you know, fell in love with the sport. Um, and since I was new to it, I actually, um, I was open to anything really, right? I was, I was open to anything. No one wanted to be a long snapper, not a sexy position. I did it. I was good at it. And that's kind of what started it. Um, did it in, you know, Pop Warner and then ultimately in high school and then obviously college, yeah. So how did Miami complete your career? Um, so <laughs> funny how like the universe works, right? Al Golden actually went to my high school. Um, his nephew... Um, was a good friend of mine on the football team. Shout out to Greg. Um, but, you know, gave my gave my tape to my buddy Greg. Her dad gave it to his brother Al. And they're like, oh, yeah, we'll take this kid as a walk-on. You know, we need Bobby kind of deal. <laughs> so were you, were you a preferred walk-on in that process? I was. Yeah, I was a preferred walk-on. Now, how does that process, how is a preferred walk-on different from your average walk-on? So, to be honest, I don't know the average walk-on process. Um, well, Besides, like, they get into school and then they try out. I think, you know, that, that's the main difference. Whereas um, my senior year, essentially, you know, they're reaching out to me. I they actually visit. They, they invited me to visit. Um, I think I came in, like, February. My dad and I did a little keys trip as well that weekend. But, yeah, I saw the facilities. You know, they had me come in and um, really get to know everybody, which was, like, a nice experience. Um, and I got accepted um, pretty much literally well, half the reason probably because of that. You know, gotcha. And did you try out for the team at any point? Was it like a workout when you visited, or how? Was that? No, not at all. Yeah, they just they like my tape. Um, they uh, they like my size. You know, um, for a walk on, but also for like you know, the third string long snapper, essentially or fourth string, however it was at that point. So you, know. you so basically the first time they saw you snap in person was first day of workout. Right? Yeah, yeah, maybe not. <laughs> all right. So talk to me about the process of. You know, starting practice, you obviously play New Jersey's serious football. It's not like it's a joke football in New Jersey, yeah. but now you're here at the college level. What was that like? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it was interesting to be a walk on because ultimately it was the first time I was on a, I was on a sports team where I was ultimately insignificant, or I should say, like, replaceable is a better word. But obviously, walk on terribly important for teams, for team building. But yeah, first time that I was on a I was on a, a team where basically, like, if I was gone, someone was right behind me. Like, it yeah. wasn't an issue. So, um, ultimately, I, you know, was just trying to go through the process. The first semester, it was tough. I'm um, just trying to be a fly on the wall, absorb everything. Not only am I trying to catch up to the speed of being a college football, I'm obviously also starting classes, trying to make friends, um, focus on my academics. Um, and, um, you know, some people handle it differently. Um, I'll give you one example. So um, one player, he was a walk-on as well, a really good walk-on. Um, he was there all summer training, so he had had a locker and all that. I come in the day before camp. We were in the old locker room, not as many lockers. So some people had to share. So first day of camp, I come in. You know, he's been trying to earn a scholarship. He's been working hard. He's, he wasn't as getting many, as many reps. I come up, he's like, who's this guy I have to share a locker with? He's taking it out on me type deal. He actually ended up transferring, um, you know, th- that next semester, I think. So some people, you know, it's a humbling experience, honestly, in some situations. Because you, you're coming from, like, the man, most likely in your high school, like one of the top dogs in your high, on your team, to, you know, if you're not a scholarship player, you know, you're not front of the line. You kind of have to figure your way out so um different for different people for sure 
what was the conditioning like, like right away for you guys? <laughs> Horrible, honestly. Um, so they were called gassers, and there was 20 of them. We run sideline to sideline. Are these like 110s or? So, no, 110s is the length of the field, right? But the gasser specifically was sideline to sideline. Yeah. So each um, position group, well, we split it up skill, um, combo, and then bigs. So skill, obviously, wide receivers, DBs, wide guys, combo, linebackers, quarterbacks, specialists, um, the bigs, obviously, the linemen. Um, I think the time that you had to make was 16, 18, and 20 seconds. And so the first five, eight are fine. You know, you get to 12 in the summer because we're doing these things in the summer as well. Yeah. Like, that's what we're doing. These. Humidity is horrible. Um, you know, by, by rep 11, 12, it's like, oh, just get me through this, you know. <laughs> and, and you're running with a specialist, right? So specialist quarterbacks and linebackers in that specific conditioning. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So best dudes there. All right? yeah. And at this point, it's not like the walk has an extra conditioning to weed people out. Like, you're basically doing, at this point, what everybody else is Oh, absolutely, yeah. Uh, we're doing everything. Everything's the same. Everything that we're doing is the same. The lifts, the conditioning, um, and especially me coming in late. I, I, you know, some people come in early um, and practice throughout the entire summer, June, July, even the day before camp. So ultimately, my day was not what it should have been. I mean, that was probably more on me, but you know, <laughs> so wake up call. How, how are you interacting with the kids, at least initially? Um, it's, um, it's good. You know, it's, it's fine. I mean, some people are, you know, cool with it. Some people, you know, you know don't have the time of day, but that's just how it is. It's all personality based, really. It's not, it's not more of like a hierarchy or, hierarchy or anything like that you know. now you being the log snapper I mean, were you like involved with any of the offensive line stuff i mean i know it's different as far as the contact rules for the log snapper like are you doing any of that kind of stuff no i'm not um but you know i'll tell you a funny story actually so like i like i said i they wanted me in as a um, a, a uh, scout team right yeah. i like guess a body so my first day i'm actually they tell me what position you want to play and i'm like i was a in high school i was a dn um, as long as, as well as an offensive tackle. So they say, you know, even though, even though my body type is really more of a linebacker, I was like, I know DM. Right. So the first day, I was, they're like, all right, go, go to the meeting then. I walk in, everyone's looking at me, I'm like 60, 70 pounds lighter than anyone else. They're like, are you lost? <laughs> <laughs> um, the first five minutes, I take a test and I fail the test. I don't know anything with the first day. And we go out to practice the first, for, for, Camp. I'm trying to do this sled drill. I can't even lift it up. <laughs> Everyone's like, you know, get this kid out of here. He's gonna get hurt. Like whatever liability. So you know, the next, the next special teams drill, whatever that we had, I went with the specialist did some drills, and the older guys were like, listen, just don't go back over there. Like, just stay here. <laughs> I'm like, all right, fine. And that's literally how I solely became a special teams player. Uh, listen, that's why I call a specialist, right? You got to hone your craft for so, sure. So you, you know, more. Third team, your whole life. Ultimately, you broke into the lineup and were able to play. Talk about that process. So yeah, um, well, the starting long snapper was Sean McNally. Great guy, unbelievable guy. Um, kind of was essentially my mentor. Um, he was amazing at his craft, like so fast with his snaps. Um, technique was amazing. So I actually my first summer. When, um, so after my freshman year, um, that first summer I was really he, he let me stay in his department. I was sleeping on a couch. Um, and we would just snap every day um, and just, you know, like I said, with, the, with, with coming as a walker, I'm kind of a humbling experience. That kind of made me more hungry, right? I was like, all right, I don't want to just be at the bottom of the barrel. I kind of want to earn my spot here on this team. I want to I want to be like everyone else. Like, I want to I earn, yeah, why I'm on the team. So that first summer um, between my freshman and sophomore year, I, I was practicing with him um, every single day in the summer, um, not even team drills. It was literally just me and him. And um, yeah, that just, just 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 learning the work ethic and um, being methodical about it. Um, and it's really to be good at this level, you, you have to go above and beyond. <clears throat> above and beyond, excuse me. Uh, you can't just do what the coaches tell you to do. You can do more than that. You really want to be successful. Um, and so ultimately, um, my first two years didn't play. Obviously, went through my first year. My third year, my junior year, um, unfortunately, the starter got hurt. Tom McNally had great the new starting long snapper. Um, he had actually tore the ACL and I was up next. And so um, that was actually Michael Badgley's first year kicking. 
And him and I, him and I were just we were in the same battery, and he just felt really comfortable with me. So I actually had started short snapping that year with him because Matt Gudis, the field leader, I think he, I think his, he had back issues, so he couldn't he couldn't even go. So Badge went in, um, and because Badge and I were were um, you know just in the same battery, he was comfortable with me. I actually started short snapping. I think that was game three in Nebraska, actually, which was a nerve wracking experience. That place is 110, I think, and just walked all noise bouncing so that was another experience on its own and i think i started uh, long snapping uh game four or five so um i ended up earning a scholarship actually my fourth year my uh my, my senior year like you know I, you know i felt really you know really great about that because of all the work i had put in and i managed my opportunity that's awesome so just about long snapping and snapping turn, i want to ask you some questions that seem obvious to you but some people i know don't Think about this part yeah. of the game as much. Yeah. So <laughs> in terms of you're talking about like the skills you're trying to develop at the long snapper. People know obviously don't do a bad snap like or goes in the dirt. That's not that simple. What are the different attributes and skills that you need to sharpen as a snapper? So yeah, um just like with punting and kicking, um flexibility is a huge thing. Um and along with that, because because you know, you really are getting a lot of hamstring, um, you're going from Bending to straightening out as fast as you can. That's really where most of your power is. You're kind of pushing backwards in your hands for most of the power there. Now, the other thing is really your grip. Um, so you, um, I probably wouldn't be able to play it without having a ball in my hand, but, um, you know, grip, grip is important. Grip strength is important. Forearm strength is important um, because that ultimately, you know, that helps with, you know, your spiral and your accuracy and all that. Um, yeah, that's, uh, yeah. So, so basically, getting it with velocity and accuracy sounds like a pitcher, right? Exactly. In terms of working exactly. on yourself, are we doing that like we doing like yoga and stuff, like when you work training or like and your grip? Like I know you know my son's a student, so you're kind of always squeezing to get your grip right or doing stuff like that. Sure. Um, yeah, definitely. I, I love yoga. Actually, definitely a lot of yoga. Um, and just constantly throw mowing every day because the other thing is you have to be flexible, but. If we're snapping every day, using the same muscles every day, those muscles are getting fatigued and tightening. So it's like constant. It's you know, I will say being being a specialist is very tedious, right? Along with like, because first of all, the technique that you have to do, it's to be perfect, you have to do the same technique, the same exact way every single time. And um, you know, if you're using the same muscles, you know, you got to stay flexible, but they're tightening every single day because you're using them the same ones every single day. So you have to be methodical in terms of. Yeah, the, uh, the recovery, the, the strengthening, and uh, the flexibility as much as possible. Yeah. And the practice with a specialist, because you know, for those of who didn't play in college, you know, most of us, it's like your specialists are really just players on the team. It's a part of practice. It's not like they have their own practice. Sure. Whereas in college, you go to college practice, you guys are kind of off, off on your own. Yes. So what's that like as far as basically having your own practice different from the rest of the team? Yeah, so just the way, um, honestly, just the way like the offense is kind of their own thing, the defense is kind of their own, th their own thing, we really are our own. Um, and it's really all on us to do what we need to do. Um, even um, in my experience, like when Mark Rick first came in, Todd Hartley was a special teams coordinator. He was also the tight ends coach. So he was with the tight ends all day. Um, we had Danny Coulter, who's um, now heavily involved in special teams, um, really running the show there, essentially under uh, Coach Cristobal. Um, we yeah, we really just are doing our own thing on our own field, which it's nice and quiet. You know, it's kind of it's a in terms of stress. Like obviously, <laughs> offensive defense, it's stress twenty four seven. They're like for us, you know, we're just kind of going about our process and kind of doing <laughs> it like nonchalantly, to be honest. Obviously, like the mental focus needs to be there with our you know our reps and everything, but um, slow pace for sure because. You can only kick, punt, and snap for so many hours, right? Practice is two, two and a half hours, three hours. Like, um, yeah, yeah, we can only, one person can only, you know, do it for like an hour probably. And so we take turns. Off a bit. So it's really the conditioning, you know, kicking your butt as far as being on the team, like having to do, when the, everybody does conditioning together, and that's where it's really efficient, right? Yeah. Well, surprisingly, like, well, at least without who I was with, Michael Badgley, Justin Vogel, um, and the ones before, um, we were all really athletic. Um, you know, like Badge was like a kick returner, punt returner in uh, in high school. He was doing everything. So we came in, like most of us came in um, 
pretty athletic, so we could keep up for sure. But I will say, um, in terms of like respect, I, I like on the team. It's funny because um, with the rest of the positions and players, it's like we know who are five stars. We know who are like the big dogs coming in, and you know they kind of already have like their name, obviously in the media and respect. With specialists, it's like you, you, we really, you really got to earn your spot on the team in terms of like the respect with all the rest of the players. Um, like once they see, you know, once you know, field goal kickers are banging their field goal kicks, like all right, cool, like we can trust on him, we can rely on him. But until you do that, until you show that, it's really like all right, well, we'll, we'll wait to see. Like you, know, you got to earn your stripes there. It's funny because thinking back to those teams, they had a lot of pros on those teams that you play play with a lot of guys for in the sure. yeah. But I mean, honestly, as far as per capita. You know, specialist Madge is still playing. Uh, uh, O'Con- O'Connell's still playing uh, for the, or he was playing for a while. The punter that you guys got from Cincinnati, you were yeah. there for that. Right? Uh, um, Madge, yes, you know? Pal Donald. Pal Donald, sorry. Yes, and then uh, you know, Renault Vogel kind of bounced around a little bit. So, like you were playing with a lot of guys that were pros, like in your own group. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and all those guys were great guys, super athletic. Justin Vogel, really, he was awesome. He, I think um, he did amazing for for Green Bay his rookie year, and then for whatever reason, because. You know, uh, you know, management is the way they are in the NFL, and you know, they overthink themselves sometimes. Um, he should have had a longer career. Pat had a great career. Bad, just um, I'm not sure if Pat's going on right now, but um, and then Badge with the Lions, obviously, um, killing it. So you, you you had an interesting situation because Golden brought you in. Golden gets fired. Rick comes in your last year as a player. So what was that for someone like you who you know you knew his nephew? You you're from his town. He really was he recruited everybody, but you were someone that was, you know, more closely aligned just in terms of geography. Now he's gone. You're, you got a coach who doesn't know you really. What was that process like? Yeah, so start to finish, I will say, I won't go too deep into the firing, but I wasn't getting fired was honestly one of the most more crazy situations that I've ever been in in my life, just because all the emotion, there's so many layers to it, obviously. Um that was obviously during the season. We didn't know Mark was going to be our coach until later on, but um, really crazy experience. Um, now, Mark Rick coming in was kind of – it was pretty It was pretty awesome in terms of um, he came in and you could just sense, like, this is – this guy, like, means business. This guy knows what he's talking about. He, he really was, like, a CEO for sure. He knew how to handle everything. Um, and he just kind of uh, – he, he garnered a lot of respect from the get-go, um, and it was powerful. And so that, like, um, obviously we didn't do all the things we wanted to do in his time, um, but I think that was a good stepping stone, like, towards the right direction um, and kind of, like, bettering our program for sure. You must have made um, a good impression because he kept you around, right, as a coach for the next year. So talk about that. Absolutely, yeah. So, like, um, Tom Hartley was a special teams coordinator, so obviously my coach my fifth year when they came in. Um, had a great relationship with him um, and him being tight ends and special teams, he had two assistants, one spot opened up um, and I kind of took that role on once, once I was done with um, coaching. Uh, sorry, once I was done with playing. So I, I wanted to start, yeah, I wanted to start coaching and kind of see that aspect of it. And I did that for two years, for basically the last two years of their, of their coaching cycle. Um, it was a cool experience. I, I like, I'm happy I did it. Um, I just, uh, going through it it just wasn't the same from being on the field being a player to coaching it just wasn't the same um especially um like seeing the coaches kind of you know, young kids they don't see them as much and i just love that aspect of it either uh, it's a grind it's a grind um and they get paid for it which is a positive but the negative is you know they're, they're not around as much for like their families which um I, you know for me personally i'm a big family guy so um didn't really, yeah, I wanted to move on. You know, in those two years, or at least the first two years, the so last year as a player and then the fifth year as a coach, you know, Miami started having some success. But then you, you were there for you know, the ship, the probation stuff, you were there for some low moments with, with, with the program. Mm-hmm. Now, your last year playing, your first year coaching, it's a little better. I mean, what was that like feeling that Miami was kind of going in the right direction for you, having been for low moments? Um. Yeah, we had a ton of transition in my – well, I was there for seven years, which is a long time. A um, ton of transition. So one with the facilities, I started in the old locker room, like I mentioned. I mean, that place was a dump pretty much. Um, 
And so we got the new locker room, we got the new training um, training room facility, which was amazing. Um, that was with Gold, and then Mark Rick got the indoor facility. We got new coaches, um, offices, and meeting rooms. And then I know Mario's been doing some stuff. The weight rooms changed. Um, so that alone has been awesome. Um, in terms of like the whole dynamic, yeah, um, Golden had to clean up a lot of mess. Like there was like a lot of mess to, to, to kind of handle. And especially with the scholarship issues, right? Like we had to go through that. Like that was inconvenient. That was like tough for our team to do. Um, so obviously getting those back in, in the next coming years was, was big for us. I think that's like helped us, you know, be better within our um, division and conference and everything. Um, yeah. No, it was, it was, it was a, just a fan. It was fun to see guys that had really been through a lot. Had that success winning a bowl in 2016. I guess it was your last game, right? Of winning the bowl? Yes. Yeah, so yeah. that's going on top. That respect. And then, you know, you were here for filled up stadium, Notre Dame, and all that. I want to ask you about your favorite memories as a Miami football player. Yes. Speaking of Notre Dame, I mean, that game, so that was the first year I was coaching. Um, Malik Rogier, I believe. That was our, I mean, that was our 10 and, or 11 and 1 season, I believe, when we got to number two, which, what a shame that pick game was. We could have been number one that next you know, 12 and 0. But anyway, the Notre Dame game was absolutely the most electric game I've ever been to. I mean, our fans showed up. It was, you know, the stadium was full top to bottom. Um, we had the turnover chain out. Obviously, that, was, that added to the energy and the effect of it all. Um, but that I think it was Dandy who had that pick six right before halftime. I mean, the, the, the noise, Hard Rock Stadium might never be as loud at that moment again. Um, that was um, definitely, especially against Notre Dame, too, like, you know, amazing to stop on them. So that whole experience, that game specifically, was awesome. What, what about you just as a player you know, in the locker room, on the field, whatever, practice, just you as a player, what, what really stands out? Um, player that's a good question well like you mentioned with with my first start in nebraska i mean that's a like that's a crazy college environment um i the way the stadium is built it's essentially like two walls just going up on either sideline and they packed the stadium every time um and they were there for us and the noise just like reverberated bouncing back and forth um, it was just so loud. I remember so the first two, my first two plays in were actually actual points. So we had scored touchdowns. The, the crowd was quieted down. The third snap was um, a field goal, and they were so loud for that. I remember being, holding the ball, being in my stance, and just like the, the, the air, the air, <laughs> the air particles, the helmet just like vibrating my head just so hard. And I'm just like, please don't screw up. Please don't screw up. <laughs> Do this. And uh, Patch can get through. But um that was one um and just different things honestly speaking of um you know pretty much all my memories are with that you know i keep on bringing right. him up but um did you know him in new jersey i did not no he's from north jersey i'm from like central east coast um but you know we we like broke a couple records obviously he has the the i believe the all-time leading points score for miami u.m history um we broke a couple records at Pitt. Um, he had five field goals in one game, which was like either the most or tied for the most in that stadium in general, pro or college. Um, I think he has like the longest distance in one stadium or a couple. Uh, maybe things have changed since then, but you know, even though they're his stats, uh, you know, I'm a part of that. I feel, you know, I, I feel like they're my stats too. You know, it's an operation. They're much <laughs> about it. So one thing that's really changed since you were around, players are getting paid now. Yes. yes. The table. Uh, so you <laughs> so you have Kane's connection. Exactly. We have Kane's <laughs> connection, which we, we talked about, you know, off air, which is my official and collective, which by yeah. the way, 20% off public CIS sign up. Yeah. But you know, you didn't have that, obviously, your teammates didn't have that available when you were, <laughs> were in college. Knowing what you know about just the team and everything else, I mean, what would, how much game changer is that it would have been for, for you guys yeah i think it's i think it's amazing i think it's an opportunity for really everyone to get involved like like if i was still well even right now you know my mom and my aunt are both alumni and obviously they experienced 
um, all of my playing days, like for them to be able to contribute and, and for just fans everywhere to be able to contribute um, because obviously they couldn't with the big money with the dollar signs that go on on, on the upper levels. Um, you know, they, they can be involved and, and they can, they can support their, their, their team. And it, it's an amazing aspect, which um, I'm so glad it started. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. No, it's a, it's a game changer. My name is on top of we need your, your help for that to continue. Now, football's done. You've been doing it for seven years. So you're like almost like a doctor of football at this point. You know? <laughs> What's the next step for you after that? Um, so, yeah, so I did, I did coach it for two years. Um, I actually moved back to New Jersey, got a sales job as any college graduate that doesn't want to follow their uh, major does. Yeah. Um, worked for a medical media company in an advertising space. Did that for two years. Really didn't love it um and also missing miami so much um i really do love the city <laughs> so you know i was i was in home new jersey you know it's snowing there it's rainy it's cold i'm like not loving my job i was like i gotta move back to miami i've always been um interested in real estate um and i actually almost considered going to grad school at um for real estate didn't do that but um you know three years ago pretty much last week actually i got my real estate license and I started doing real estate, um, and it's just been a, it's been it's been a great time being back in the city. Um, you know, going to amazing luxury apartments, meeting amazing people. It's a it's a fun environment, and um, it's a honestly it's the first it's the first job I've had that I've been like hell yeah, like really excited to go go to every single day, um, confident and uh, and happy about it. Yeah, this is related, but I want to ask you: with so many New Jersey people at the University of Miami students and also those players you think about Badgley yourself and Greg Olson and Joku, a ton of people before sure. that. Yeah. What is it about that area that attractions the University of Miami and the Miami market in general? Yes. Yeah, so uh, funny enough, um, my parents actually both went to University of Miami. Um, they met there. My mom grew up in South Miami. My dad grew up in New Jersey. Um, and then my aunt was also an alumni. So they got together there. So that's what was my personal interest. Um, grew up a Miami fan. So it was really a dream come true to, to come here. Um, as far as everyone else, you know, it, the university in general has so many Northeastern kids, especially North Jersey, Long Island, um, that kind of area. Um, I think it's probably the warm weather. I think, uh, you know, obviously that area, Tri State. Yeah, um, you know, it has money. I mean, you know, you kind of have to have some money to, to like live around here. So, um, well, yeah, let's, let's talk about that. So, <laughs> yeah, I live, yeah. My, I live my beach, so I see New York yeah. play before I go. Right. And obviously, luckily, I bought a long time ago because uh, New York has had an impact on at least our market, you know, where I live, and mm -hmm. other markets as well. So, talk about the Miami real estate market in general. Yeah, so it's a, it's a beast. It's a crazy market. I mean, not only, um, you know, it's always had a ton of real estate agents and, and competition, but especially with COVID, you know, everyone was moving down here. Um, we had a huge rush. Um, now it's changed since then. So since since I started, I started in the middle of COVID, which was obviously rolling. It, it was rolling and everyone was coming down here. Everyone was getting business. You know, everyone, their mother was getting their license because their cousin, their, their uncle was selling. So it was like easy. And then... About two years ago was when interest rates started dropping. And so the complete opposite happened. We went from high speed to, you know, so many buyers backing out of the market because they don't want to buy or they can't buy. Um, so from my experience, it's it's been a crazy roller coaster, to be honest. And I, I'm just trying to, like, learn. Honestly, it's been a great learning experience because I, I was in, in the high speed market. And now I'm kind of learning the low speed market, I guess you could say. Um, so good experience there. Um, but just in general, I mean, everyone still wants to be here. The only thing that has slowed us down is the interest rates ultimately going up to seven, eight percent. Um, but once that comes back down, I mean, people are it, it's, people are going to start buying here again, like, like like crazy. Now you're an all-purpose, you know, real estate agent. So as far as listeners might be either selling or, or buying or just interested in real estate in general, I mean, what message do you have to them? Yeah, um, I really am all purpose. You know, I, I work with everybody, renters, buyers, um, sellers. You know, I got a bunch of listings now. Cracking into the luxury um, market right now, actually. Got a listing in Brickell City Center with the Rise, my three-bedroom. 
Um, but um, yeah, I'm, I, I really do do it all. Um, and so really, I, I can accommodate really any person and I'm happy to help, especially Gaines fam, you know. <laughs> Where can they find you? Um, so my Instagram Frank Gabriel Realtor, um, at Frank Gabriel Realtor, you can do that. Um, TikTok as well. Um, and I have a website, FrankGabrielRealtor.com. Um, so yeah, if you, or you can, yeah, and if you can look me up on Google as well, you can, you know, my number's on there. You can call me, text me anytime. That's <laughs> awesome. So listen, if you're looking to sell, move down here and you're not here, you want to be here, talk to Frank, keep it in the family. Uh, with the hurricane. So Frank, may I appreciate you joining us and kind of setting light on some people that are integral that don't get the attention they deserve. Um, so man, I appreciate having you. Yeah, if I can say one last thing Please. as well, like, um, you know, I'm so proud to be a University of Miami alumni. Um, you know, the whole Canes fam thing, it's not like a marketing thing. It's not hyperbole. Like, it really is an awesome thing. Like, I bought my unit two years ago in Brickell. Um, I, I did I had Don Billy Jr. do the course. He calls me up personally. He says, Hey, here's my personal number. Like, so happy, you know, so happy like to reach out to you. I remember your playing day. And that meant a lot to me. You know, going to the spring game, meeting you, you invited me down here. Amazing. I, I appreciate the hell out of that. Um, you got a great setup here and you're doing great. And, um, I appreciate you. They see you're better host than me because I have to ask you, <laughs> I know our, our fans want to hear about, which is. Did you see a practice? You were there. You saw a great practice. What, what was your impression of the team? I'm very excited. Um, you know, I always like to temper my emotions, you know, in the, in the, in the off season. Um, obviously, there's a ton of work to be had, and football is football. But, um, you know, I mean, my personal opinion, it all comes down to the quarterback. And it sounds like I, you know, we saw him. We saw him at practice. It sounds like we got one. I don't want to. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I can confirm you were there. So. Oh, it's not just me hyping up. I mean, it looks different right? with him out there, number one. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he's ripping the ball around. I mean, it just looks good. It feels good. Everyone's confident about the whole thing. So um I'm excited. And I like that special, <laughs> the best special teams we did to the country last year. Shout out to Danny. Absolutely. Shout out to Danny for sure. He's my boy. Um, he's got players. He's got players coming in, and, and they're doing a great job. They're doing what they have to do. So. Well, Frank Manning, I appreciate you. Good luck. And uh, you can come on anytime, man. We're here. I appreciate you. Thank you. Go Canes. Yeah. This an insight to the Canes. And you know we ain't playing no games. Joaquin said dominate. So that's what we do. Home of the legends and seventh floor crew. Down in Miami where hurricanes brew. You here for the rumors. We bring you the news. Because it's all about the you. And nobody do it like Kane's in sight 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 It's Kane's in sight